Thank you. Good morning. morning. Welcome. It's a delight to have you in the house of the Lord this morning, and welcome to those who are online. We keep saying that in this new world that we're in now, that we think it's fine if you have your phone on in church, try to put it on vibrate so it's not ringing, but go ahead and uh, like, put your emojis in if you want to, folks who put their prayer requests in, and obviously you can do that at home as well, and so we're trying to have fun with that. Folks who are out in the congregation, of course, are doing the um, face mask thing and the social distancing, and of course, uh, we're delighted to have everyone with us at home, and we have folks that are tuned in from other states and even other countries occasionally, so it's just a delight, and it amidst every challenge and obstacle, it reminds us that there's always a blessing, and so we're recognizing that we are connected in ways that we never really understood. A couple of announcements this morning. First of all, I know it's a little rainy this morning, but it's clearing up later today. It's supposed to be a beautiful week in the 70s and sunny, so it's just a blessing. But out on Lisa's Faith and Fitness Trail are now 14 scarecrows, more to come. And we have families that are sort of adopting a spot, and there's a great theme. So thanks to Terry for organizing that. Thanks to everyone who's putting them out there. So go out there, and amidst to your sort of morning or afternoon walk that's either exercise or sort of reflective, you kind of enjoy some local art and get in the season of fall. So uh, we're so thankful for that. And then also, it's World Communion Sunday this morning. And we are reminded that folks all over the world are celebrating World Communion. And they have different rhythms and time, but we try to take one Sunday out of the year where as many folks as possible in different races and places are celebrating communion. So I invite you, if you're here in the house, there are prepackaged communion out there in the entranceway. If you haven't gotten those, go ahead, go ahead and go out and get those. And if you're at home, go ahead and put out some bread, some juice and wine, whatever you like. And in a time right now where we think so often as we look at our community and our country and our world of the divisions that are highlighted, this is a morning when we think about what unites us, what brings us together around the Lord's table. And so we're celebrating that today. We invite you to be in worship with Psalm 33. We wait in hope for the Lord. In Him our hearts rejoice. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord. God is good. All the time. Praise the Lord. We invite you to stand and join in worship in music. I love that hymn, and it's got a great message as well. This morning, we continue our series on home improvement, and this morning, we're in the dining room 
with guess who's coming to dinner. We are in Luke chapter 14, verses 15 through 24. When one of those at table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I just bought a field. I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on the way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and responded to this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but still there's more room. Then the master told his servant, go out the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house may be full. I tell you, not one of those who are invited will get a taste of my banquet. May the Lord bless his word to our hearts and minds this morning. Well, as I said, we are continuing this series, Home Improvement, with guess who's coming to dinner this morning. If you were here last week or online last week, you know that I mentioned that one of the big things that's happening during this pandemic, since so many people are at home so often, is there's a huge boom in the home improvement business uh, at home and, of course, in the store. So one of the best places to meet people are Lowe's, Menards, Home Depot, all those things. But there's all kinds of uh, projects that people have been doing inside and outside. And we talked last week about making sure that our foundation is storm ready. So we think a lot of time about what you can see, but what's underneath is really important. And we talked about how that Christ is the only sure foundation that makes our lives storm ready. Well, it's not just the foundation, it's not just additions, but I don't know how many people out there are sort of the decorator group, you know, not the necessarily building a new room or a new patio, but any do-it-yourselves when it comes to sort of refurbishing the inside out there. Well, uh, you, you might be a painter, so you like to paint your dining room, or you might be the person who likes to do recoloring of the trim or wallpaper or maybe furnishings, but it's amazing what you can do. And I mentioned that I've got my hard hat from Habitat for Humanity Women's Build, uh, but you've got the, the paint roller that's there, and I know you're thinking, well, what about, what do you need the hard hat for painting? Well, if you're like me, it's amazing because I'm actually really good at, I can do it without even the, you know, the painter's tape, really good on edges and good on not getting on the floor. But you know, every time I paint, you know where I do get paint? My daughter will say, Dad, you got paint all over your hair. So that's what happens to me anyway. I don't know what you're like on that. So even while I'm painting, it doesn't hurt to have that hard helmet on. I'm going to go ahead and take it off this morning. But uh, if you are that person, I guess we can put this out here, can't we? You can handle that. <clears throat> the dining room. Well, once you get done with your new project on the dining room and you're refurbishing it, what do you do? Especially not during the pandemic. Well, you invite friends and family to a great banquet, right? And I know so many of you out there do exactly that. And I know this is a pandemic right now. So some of you may have to wait for that big banquet until the pandemic is over. But you're going to have some nice celebrations for Thanksgiving or Christmas, and you love to sort of spread the table. I love going to Nancy Christmas's home because she does something that I don't know that a lot of people do, but she got me doing this ourselves in our own family, which is that when you go to Nancy's house, it might be a week before the banquet, it might even be two weeks ahead, but she sets the table. I, I don't mean the food, but she puts all this beautiful china around the table with all the glass furnishing and the silverware and the napkins. And it just looks beautiful because so many times we forget that it does look beautiful. I mean, because we got the food out there and then we, we say a blessing, hopefully, and give thanks. And then we, we kind of dive in and then we've got dirty dishes. But you know that, that furniture and that table and that all those dining room dishes, they look beautiful, don't they? But none of it makes any sense without the dinner itself. And it's interesting because Jesus may have been thinking about some setting like this when he told that parable this morning. 
But it's a very interesting story because you'll never guess who's coming to dinner. With that, I invite you to walk back into the story. The backstory is this. Jesus has been reputed throughout the city and even the entire region as a person who is eating and dining and having a good time with all the wrong crowd, with all the wrong people, sinners and tax collectors, not the people from the right side of town. So the Pharisees, the religious leaders, come to Jesus and challenge him on that point. And it's within that context that Jesus tells this story. There's another other stories, but I want to focus on this one this morning. And the story goes like this, that this individual is planning a great banquet, a great feast, and he sends out save-the-date cards, okay, so people know in advance the great banquet's coming, and then he sends out a servant to invite the people who were invited and says the banquet is now ready, come, and they make up a bunch of excuses, right? So one person says, I just bought a piece of property, I need to go and see it. I don't know how many of you buy a piece of property and never saw it before, but this is before Zillow and online, so you probably would want to see it ahead of time. Another person says, well, I, I need to uh, go and try out the five yoke of oxen I just bought. I mean, would you really not try out a yoke of oxen before buying them? The only person who seems to have a legitimate excuse is the person who just got married. Okay, I'll give you that one. But everyone else has got, you know, a pretty lame excuse. And I just want to push pause for a moment on this story and ask you, what's your excuse this morning? And not excuse for the banquet, right? But do we sometimes make excuses about not coming to church? Now, I know, I know there's a pandemic, so there's a good reason for folks who don't want to come into the Lord's house, but it is online, right? So you don't really have that excuse. You can tune in online. And when you think about it, sometimes we just take church for granted. We take God's grace and love for granted, not just on Sundays, but every day of the year many times. And so we're reminded of just how valuable it is to be around the Lord's table, the Lord's table of grace and love and forgiveness. And so I just challenge you not to think about your neighbor or even your spouse's excuse, but what's your excuse? And what can you do to maybe put more value on the Lord's invitation to you to come around the table? Well, to go back to this story, the landowner is so upset about this. He says, listen, go out into the highways and byways, the street alleys, and invite the poor, the lame, the orphans, the fatherless, everyone into God's house. And so the servant goes out and does exactly that. And then he comes back and says, I've done exactly that. And the landowner says, there's still more room. So go on out and to keep inviting people, the last, the lonely, the least, the marginalized of society into this great banquet. You know, it's interesting because we have two roles this morning. The first is we are invited as guests of the Lord himself to his own banquet table, and we're reminded of that with Holy Communion this morning, with World Communion. So we're invited, so we can ask ourselves, are we making excuses, are we really appreciating that like we should? But you and I are also the servants that are called to invite other people to this great dinner, to go out into the highways and byways of life, and to invite people who we would normally think would be around that table to God's great table of grace and love. And it reminds us that all people are invited, and World Communion reminds us again that all people of every race and every place are invited to the Lord's table. So what would it be like to be among those who wouldn't normally be invited to go to this great banquet. There's a story that I love, a true story that happened back in June of 2017. You may have seen the news on this in Indianapolis. But Sarah and Logan, this couple was engaged to be married. And Sarah was a pharmacy major at Purdue. And they had dreamed about the perfect wedding and the perfect reception. And they made plans at the Rich Charles in Carmel. Never been there, but I heard it's a ritzy place. It's well-named. And this extravaganza was to have 170 guests, and it cost $30,000. I mean, that is some price tag for this wedding feast. And, of course, a beautiful wedding cake. It had hors d'oeuvres. It had appetizers. It even had these Eiffel Tower images they used. They were going to use on the wedding cake. 
But a week before the wedding, Sarah and Logan decided they weren't really right for each other, and so they tried to cancel this wedding reception. Well, the play said, listen, we've already purchased everything. We can't refund you the $30,000. And they were heartbroken once again by that, but they began to think about what they could do, and they decided to take their disappointment and their heartbreak and turn it into something special and invitational. And what they decided to do was to invite folks from the local homeless shelters all across Indianapolis to come to this wedding reception, which now became just a banquet. And so they called all these homeless shelters and said, listen, you know, the folks that are the most downcast, the most hurting, the most in need, would you let them know that they could come to this? And would you provide transportation? They helped find transportation for this. And, and so folks heard about it, right? And so they decided they were going to provide clothing fit for a wedding reception. And so all these homeless folks got a, a new wardrobe for this, and they came to this wedding, and they, and they didn't spare anything. They didn't shortchange anything. They had everyone who was, you know, invited, and they were walked to their special tables, and they were treated like royalty. And you wonder what it felt like for them. They left the wedding cake in there. They wanted it to be a celebration. They left those beautiful Eiffel Tower images there. And Sarah and Logan served the homeless in what was a night to remember. The footage is still online if you want to see it. And I wonder myself, was that a life-changing event to those folks who are normally the last, the lonely, the least, and the marginalized? I wonder what they're thinking tonight when they look back on their life and say, that was the most amazing day in my life because I, I felt special, I felt valued, I felt loved. And sure, it was some heartbreak and disappointment mixed in, but I wonder what would happen if we were to ask each and every one of those folks who were downcast and lonely and homeless what it meant to them. And I wonder in our own life sometimes if we would take the heartbreak of our life and make it a table of invitation somehow through God's blessing and grace. But more than anything else, when I think about this story, I can't help but imagine that it's very much like the story that Jesus told, that this moment of disappointment became a moment of invitation to the last, the lonely, the least, the forgotten, the marginalized, and Jesus went out of his way to tell us that we are people that get to send the invitations out personally to those who are out in the highways and byways who wouldn't normally be invited to a great banquet. So I ask you this morning, are you inviting those out in the highways and byways the orphans, the widows, the last, the lonely, the least, the marginalized, into God's house, into God's amazing banquet, amazing grace. There's something else I want to think about, and that's a film that I love. And if you're younger, you probably don't remember this. And I was pretty young at the time. But back in 1967, one of the top 100 films of the 20th century came to production, and the name of it was Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. Anyone seen it? Are you out there? If you have not, you need to see it. One of the top 100 films of the 20th century. It starred an all-star cast. Sidney Poitier, uh, Spencer Tracy, the last movie that he ever made, uh, Catherine Hepburn, and the young star at the time, uh, Catherine Houghton. And the plot line goes like this. Uh, Matt and Christina Drayton, played by Catherine Hepburn and, and uh, Spencer Tracy, are progressive liberals and proud of it in San Francisco. A and they're proud that they're open-minded. Their daughter, Joanna, goes to Hawaii and sends them a message that she has become engaged to a doctor. And then they find out that this doctor, who is Sidney Poitier, is black. And so, even though they're progressive and liberal and open-minded, all of a sudden, uh, it's their personal life, not their political views, that are at risk. And so, uh, what they find out is that he has been offered a job with the World Health Organization, and he needs to fly to Geneva. And so, they are going to come to dinner with them, and his parents are going to fly up from L.A., and they're all going to have dinner, and they need to decide if they're really going to get married that evening. And so it is a movie filled with these vignettes when the people are having appetizers. And it turns out that John's 
parents, this young black medical doctor who's renowned and well-educated, aren't for the wedding, really. And Joanna's parents, even though they're liberal and progressive, are not for the wedding, not because they don't believe in interracial marriage, but because they think that this couple will face all too much opposition and resistance in society. So for their own good, they should never go through with this. And it turns out that the priest from the local parish stops being by because Matt missed his golf outing with him. And so he gets into the mix and conversation as well. And after it goes on for a while in this sort of rotation of people talking, Christina, the mother, has a breakthrough. And she says, maybe we've all forgotten what it's like to be in love. We're too old. And we've forgotten that it really doesn't matter what race you are, but whether or not you're in love. And so there's this beautiful image as all these people who are wrestling with this alienation and all these questions gather around the table with the priest and have a beautiful dinner. Guess who's coming to dinner? And love wins the day. Well, you and I know that despite the fact that that movie started a great conversation nationally and globally, and we've made a lot of progress on race and justice and equality for everyone, that we still have ways to go. But we're working on it. And we have come quite a ways. But it reminds us maybe of what God's table looks like too, that sometimes there's some folks around the table that we wouldn't normally think belong there or make us uncomfortable or remind us that we have some prejudice and bias in our own lives. All of us, regardless of where we're from. And so it's World Communion Sunday. And I think there's no other story that is more appropriate than the story that Jesus told us that reminds us sometimes we are alienated by social status, by race, by language, by culture, by political views, God knows, with an election coming up. But I think Jesus would remind us this morning, and hopefully every day, but most of all this morning when we celebrate World Communion, that there's more that unites us than that which divides us. That God's love and God's grace and God's forgiveness are for all people from every place and every race, and that we all have a place around God's table. And if we're struggling with that, then we need to find a place around the table too. And as we begin to talk with each other and pray with each other and share with each other and laugh with each other and cry with each other, we will be reminded that God's grace unites us and what unites us is so much greater than what divides us. So this morning on World Communion Sunday, when people all around the world are celebrating around the Lord's table, celebrating God's love and grace in different languages, in different cultures, in different places, in different political parties and views, guess who's coming to dinner? Would you join me in prayer? Lord, as we reflect on this great story of our Lord and how sometimes it makes us uncomfortable, as it should, we're also reminded that your love transcends all. Every barrier, every heartbreak, every hurt, every misgiving. So we're thankful, Lord, that we can lead into your grace this morning. So open our eyes anew and open our hearts anew to all of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, help us to find a place of grace around your great table of love, to look around that table and to recognize sisters and brothers that we need to get to know, and remind us that we also are commissioned to go out into the highways and byways and invite all your people to your table. In Christ's name, and all God's people said,
Beautiful. Thank you, Stephen. As we come before Lord in prayer, I'd just like to lift up a couple needs. Our beloved Hamer Smith passed away Friday morning peacefully, surrounded by family. Uh, service will be held on Wednesday at 11 o'clock here at the church with visitation at 10 o'clock an hour before. So the family has asked us for prayer. We want to remember them in prayer. Also, Matt from the music team on the other side of life, the beginning of life, uh, he and his fiance are expecting a baby, and there's some difficulties there with the pregnancy, and so they've requested prayer for baby and mom. And I know we have some other folks that are um, expecting and, and that need our prayers as well. I know there's lots of other needs in our lives and our community and our world, so I just invite us to take a few moments in silent prayer and then join together in united prayer. Lord, thank you for your day, a day where we can step aside from the busyness of life, and even though we do still feel the burdens that are on our shoulders, we can realize that we can share those burdens with you, a day when we can also realize that there are blessings each and every day, even amid the challenges of life, and so we can pause to give thanks for those. So this morning, we thank you for the blessings before we bring you the burdens. We're thankful for even the rain that is here to bless our lands. We're thankful for our farms and fields and factories and so many other blessings. We're thankful for places we can work and grow and learn and play. We're thankful for our community and our country and our global community. We're also thankful for our family of faith, along with friends and family, folks who can journey all of life's hills and valleys with us. But most of all, we're thankful for you, our Lord and Savior, for you've come into our world to share our hurt and brokenness, to show us the way of healing and love and grace. You're willing not only to teach us, but to go to the cross to reach us. And in amazing grace, you laid down your life on Calvary. that We would know forgiveness and grace. And we're raised to new life, that we would know the power of the resurrection in this life and the promise of new life to come. Help us to open our hearts and lives to your love and grace this morning. And help us to share your hope and peace and love with others near and far. Lord, we also lift our burdens to you today. We lift up those who've lost loved ones and pray that your peace and love and strength would be very near and dear to them today and in the days and weeks ahead. We also lift up those who need a healing touch whether touched by this pandemic or so many of life's ills. We pray, Lord, that you bless those who are caring for them right now with strength and courage. But we also pray that you, our great physician, would touch and strengthen them in body, mind, and spirit, that they may feel your healing presence. We lift up our world that is going through so many divisions right now and pray for your healing presence there as well. We pray for your gifts of understanding, of care, of concern, of wisdom and compassion for all people in all places. Lord, we pray that we as your church would be a shining light in the darkness of our world, one that would welcome everyone near and far of every color and every language, every race and every place. 
And this morning, help us as we join around your table to celebrate your love and to re-experience that amazing grace. We pray for all of our missions and ministries, but we especially lift up those suffering from the fires in California, as well as those who still suffer from the hurricanes in our Gulf Coast. We pray all this and that we would accept each day as your gift through Christ our Lord and all God's people said, amen. We continue with the spirit of prayer around our Lord's table. If you have not gotten one of the communion packets that are at the entrance, we invite you to do so. And if you are at home, we invite you to get out your bread and your juice or wine this morning. And even though we are separated, we know that we are very much connected in the very most important way. This is the joyful feast of our Lord. And people are invited from north and south and from east and west. And we especially celebrate that this morning and are reminded because the globe is on the communion table, but more importantly, Christ's invitation is to all people. So let's take a moment and go before the Lord in silent confession of our sins and shortcomings. Know this, friends, that even though our sins are as scarlet, God has promised they can be white as snow, and so we know that we are forgiven through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us lift up our hearts. Let us give thanks to God most high. Jesus said, I'm the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have life abundantly. On the same night in which he was betrayed, the Gospels record that while they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks and offered to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, this is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Will you join me in prayer? Lord, as we gather around your table this morning, and as those all around our world gather around your table this morning, we pray that you would bless these gifts of the bread and the cup. We pray that you would continue your forgiving presence in our lives, empower us with your spirit, and guide us with your word. May we love and serve you and love and serve our neighbor with joy and thankfulness each and every day. We're thankful that we can lean on your grace and be empowered by your spirit. We pray this in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. On the same night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and blessed it, and said, this is my body given for you. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. The body of our Lord, the bread of heaven. Jesus took the cup. He said, this is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you do this, do this remembering me, the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Amen. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. The one who comes to me will never go hungry, and one who believes in me will never thirst. Jesus said, I'm the vine, and you are the branches. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And this is my command, that you love one another. Amen.
Thank you for joining us for World Communion Sunday. We look forward to the Lord's Prayer that we'll join together and go forth the blessing of Almighty God, the love of the Father, the grace of our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus, and the peace and power of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen.